Oh. Hey, I want to share a message with you tonight, and I have not asked for the pulpit just yet because I'm just going to do a little thing on the screen. So thank you, team, for, uh, for leading us in worship tonight. That was great. And uh, we are going to go on a little journey from the east coast of Australia, the sheltered little, uh, all the way across to the Middle East, over the Indian Ocean, if you can see that. We're going to zoom in here. You can see Israel down there. You can see Turkey. You can see Greece. We're going to zoom in uh, on what we knew in Bible times. It was called Asia Minor, and it's actually modern-day Turkey. And we're going to go to a little, look at this little place. How, how good is Google Earth? Uh, Pro, by the way. If you get Pro, you get the 3D buildings. Who likes the Colosseum sitting there? We are staring at the ruins of an ancient city. It's on the northern shores of the Mediterranean Sea. And this is the city of Ephesus. And today, this site is uh, a tourist attraction, basically. There's a new city just across the road from it. But uh, it's famous for its ruins, of course. And so here is some of the ruins that you can go to Ephesus today and see. And uh, it's pretty full on. There's a whole bunch of different pictures. You can go from right across on the left all the way ahead. There's different pictures of all the ruins that you can go to Ephesus and see. This is the city that um, is, it was alive and thriving in Bible times. But most, fam most famously, Ephesus was known as the home for the Greek goddess, Artemis of Ephesus. Artemis, what a terrible name. Who names their kid Artemis? Anyway, that's, that's what Ephesus was for. So Ephesus was this a thriving metropolis. It was one of the going cities in the first century. Trade it was right on the Mediterranean, so ships would come in and out. Culture, religion, it was like... Uh, a place where people could come from all over uh, Macedonia and they would come into this little city and they would get uh, whatever they needed from, like they'd go and see shows there, they would get their touchdown points with religion and they would worship this god, Artemis. Now the cool thing, well the crazy thing really about this god, it was Greek mythology and many of us will know Greek mythology. Artemis was the daughter of Zeus. Some of you might have heard of Zeus, the big guy with muscles. Uh, he, she was the apparent daughter and uh, she was such a big deal in Ephesus that they made this incredible temple in her honor and this is what those ruins used to look like in the first century the temple of Artemis of Ephesus and so I bring this up because if you, if you have studied anything in history, you'll have heard of the seven wonders of the ancient world, right? There's, there's, there's seven wonders of the world, but there was also seven wonders of the ancient world. And we had the great pyramids in Egypt. We had the hanging gardens of Babylon and the temple of Artemis at Ephesus is officially listed in that seven things. So Ephesus was for the Greek religion like Hollywood is for the entertainment industry. Uh, like Milan or New York would be for fashion. Ephesus was that for Greek religion. And it was here in Ephesus that the Apostle Paul spent two years of his life preaching and teaching the message of Christ with such power, right? This is, this Paul was such on the cutting edge that he began to have such a a, a genuine impact in the city and the spiritual climate that the local business owners and the tourist attraction runners and the people that were making money off Artemis of Ephesus, they started to get a bit upset. There's a story in Acts 19 and, and it's talking about the riot in Ephesus. And Beefy's going to help me out because I can't hold this all night. But uh, Acts 19, if you haven't read the story, it's really, really interesting. Uh, it says this, at about that time, Serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. What's the way? The way is just what Christianity was called before it was called Christianity. The way to God, right? That's what they called it. And so this trouble, serious trouble, began with this man named Demetrius. Now, if you know Demetrius, I don't know if you know Demetrius, but I've known one Demetrius in my life and he was trouble. So uh, this guy is probably a long lost relative, but here we go. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He was one of the guys that made the statues and made the, the souvenirs for the city and everyone would come in there, buy all his produce or all his statues or all his creations. And he's upset at Paul 
And this guy had a big business. He kept many craftsmen busy. And he calls them all together along with others employed in similar trades. And he addresses them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you have seen and heard, this man, Paul, has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. (laughs) How dare you, Paul? And he's not only done this here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. This is the guy's case against Paul. He says, of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. Good on you, Paul. What a winner. How good is that? Paul goes to Ephesus. He preaches for two years. He, he gets kicked out of the synagogue, by the way. The Jews didn't like him. So he goes and hires another hall and just starts preaching the message of Jesus and completely shifts the, cultural, the spiritual culture of that city. This is crazy because Artemis of Ephesus wasn't just a religious figure, but she was big business, held the city together. It'd be like someone coming along and saying, tourism's not real. You should never come to the Sunshine Coast for tourism ever again. What would happen to our city? I don't want to know. It's not that tourism's a god, but that's kind of what it's it's so ingrained in the culture and so ingrained in the thinking, this is what you, where do you go in Australia if you want a good holiday? You go to the Sunshine Coast. That's what, that's what people around Australia believe. That's what they think. They holiday, Queensland. And so that's kind of what it would be like. What do you go? Where do you want to go? Oh, it's on my bucket list. I'm going to go see Artemis of Ephesus. I'm going to go see the temple. It would be on your bucket list in the first century to come from all over the known world to see the statues and the craftsmanship and, and buy the souvenirs and, 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 and buy the T-shirts, you know, that have the photos of Artemis on the T-shirts. And they'd be like going home, going, I got a T-shirt, man. And, and of course, the economy would thrive around it. So... Who was this Artemis? Well, we have one more picture for you. Artemis. There you go. It's pretty inspiring, isn't it? Who wants to worship that? And that one's got its nose cut off. But this is a picture. This statue of Artemis is displayed in the museum just across the road from where all those ruins are today in Turkey. And Artemis was thought to be the great mother goddess, the great protector of fertility. She was believed to have a supernatural power, get this, she had the supernatural power to bring new life into the world. That's why you went there, because you were looking for new life. Maybe you didn't like your old life, Maybe you were going through hell at home. Maybe your business wasn't going well, whatever. But, so, but if you could get to Ephesus, if you could buy a statue of Artemis, then you would be getting in touch with the God who is in control of new life. Isn't it interesting that Paul chooses this city to preach for two years about a Jesus that was resurrected and gives a promise of new life? You see, a couple of years preaching, Paul had spread this message across the entire region. And, uh, but two years later, Paul's, Paul's not a pastor, Paul's a missionary. So Paul's off, he's gone. And so he moves on to Greece. But seven to eight years later, Paul writes a letter back to the believers in Ephesus. And he writes it from prison in Rome. So he's done another trip. He's done another trip again. He's ended up in Rome on trial. He's in prison and now he's got time to do some writing. So he starts to write a letter back to the church that he was a part of for two years back in the city of Ephesus. You got the story? It's context. But I think it's interesting that as we're going to go to the book of Ephesians tonight, chapter 2, and uh, I give you that context to have a look and read this next passage with fresh eyes. Because as we read this, you can see how the life-giving claims of Artemis and the culture of the people of Ephesus might have influenced a little bit how Paul spoke to the church about the power and the resurrection life and salvation that was available in Jesus Christ. He says this in verse 1, Ephesians 2. Once you were dead 
because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. What a nice way to start. Thanks, Paul. You're just so encouraging. Obeying the devil. The commanders of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Now he says all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. But by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Uh, but here's the but. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. Verse 6, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us. This is what God wants to do. He wants to point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards us as shown in all He's done for us who are united in Christ. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation's not a reward for the good things that we've done. So guess what? None of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Oh, I love that passage of scripture. I love that. You know, what Paul writes in his letter back to the church in Ephesus, this is now one of the bedrock foundational cornerstone scriptures of the Christian faith you used to be dead in your disobedience but now in Christ you're alive you've been raised up and God has now seated you in heavenly places God has now seated you in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And I love this because Paul didn't just shape early Christian theology. I reckon he's kind of given a big slap in the face to the big mother goddess that everyone used to worship. She used to claim that she was the life giver and you thought that your life came from her, but make no mistake, when you were still dead in your desires, you were still slave to your sin, but the real God the God of heaven and earth, the God who created you, who is so rich in mercy and love towards you, even though you were still dead. You thought you had life, but even though you were still dead, He raised you, He gave you new life when He raised Christ from the grave. Your life doesn't come from no stupid mother goddess made out of stone or wood or silver or whatever you think it is. Your life is a gift your life is a gift and it was given to you by the God who raised Jesus from the dead. And he didn't just raise Jesus, he raised you with him. When God raised Jesus, he raised up a new humanity, a new group of people who'd say, you know what, I'm going to put my faith in that. I'm going to put my trust in that. I'm going to live my life knowing if God can do that for him, that I'm part of the group that's going to go and do it. He's going to do it for me too. You see, Paul, what's he trying to do? He's lifting the vision of the Ephesian church. It's not like, well, you know, I met Jesus and I guess I'm not going to hell anymore. That's a good thing. I said, it's a low bar, you know. I was like, cool, you just got saved from getting wiped out. We're thankful for that, but surely there's more. And Paul brings this beautiful analogy of even though you were walking and you were talking and you were trying to do life the best you could, you got to understand you were dead. You were dead. You had, you had nothing in you to be able to get out of the rut that you were in. I know that was true for myself. Come on, who, who's got that testimony? You go, you know what? I was living, I was breathing, I was doing, but I was subject to the desires and the sin that, that had a trap around my heart. And I love this, Paul's lifting the vision. Hey, in Christ, you are no longer subject to the world around you. 
You're no longer subject to the world that was once within you. You're free. You're free. You've got a new life. You've got a new future. You've got a new hope. Why? Why have you got that? Because you were dead. God has not just given you life, but he has raised you up. It's interesting because this is the guts of the Christian message. This is what it is. And sometimes we, we, we talk around the fringes of Christianity a lot and we talk about all the other stuff that goes along with it, but this is the reality. You were dead, but now in Christ you're alive. We, we got to celebrate that. We got to know how powerful that is. Matthew Henry, the old Bible um, commentary, it says this about this verse. It says, sinners roll themselves in the dust. Sanctified souls sit in heavenly places and are raised above this world by Christ's grace. Uh, that's an interesting picture. Sinners roll themselves in the dust. It's like you don't have a choice. You're just kind of just going through life, facing the dirt, day after day, don't have any ability to do anything different. You're just kind of like got a ring in your nose and getting dragged along by life. But sanctified souls, those who have got their faith in Christ, man, God lifts them up. And so I've got a couple of thoughts that I want to throw at you tonight that I believe are going to encourage you and maybe help somebody out tonight, depending on what it is that you feel like maybe has still a grip on you sometimes. Who knows that we can have our faith in Christ and we can see this reality that I'm raised up and I'm seated in heavenly places, but for some reason there's still this battle that goes on and there's some stuff from our old life that still has a grip on us. Just just me? <laughs> Everyone's really quiet. Oh, not me, Pastor Rick. I, I got, it, I got it sorted out. I'm like, no tension here, no battles here, no fighting here. I'm fine, Pastor. No, no, no. Come on. Who knows? There's a battle going on, and we got to wrestle it sometimes. And we've got to come back to this place. We've got to know in Christ. So here's three simple thoughts for you. The first one: you have been raised above your carnality. Oh, there's a word we don't use very much anymore. This is, a version, this is a word that if you read any of the newer translations of the Bible, like the New Living Translation or the Message or the Passion or any of these newer translations, this word's kind of like deleted. People don't know what it means anymore. But it's, interesting, it's a very interesting word, carnality. I want you to have a look at this. Uh, the meaning in the dictionary is this, the quality or the state of being merely temporal or worldly. A lack of spiritual vitality or maturity, and then this is this is nasty, the preoccupation with or the indulgence in the flesh or the body and its passions and appetites and sensuality. It's interesting because that's what Paul was saying in verse 3. He says, all of us used to live that way. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. That's just our default Nature, you know, we were all subject to our own carnality. But in Christ, come on, there's a hope. Because even if those desires remain, if you keep coming back to the seated in high places, if you keep coming back to what the Holy Ghost does in your life, even in Christ, even if those desires remain, guess what? They're no longer in charge anymore. And that should give you some hope. I know plenty of people that have said, you know what, when I came to Christ, all of my sin and everything was washed clean and I just didn't want to do anything wrong anymore. I'm like, good on you. That's an amazing testimony. But that's not everybody's testimony. Sometimes, I don't know what it is, but, but we give our lives to Christ, we give our heart to Christ, and yet for some people it's like, boom, just disappears. For some people they've got to walk it out over a process. But the hope is not that God has taken it away necessarily. We're already, we're already in high places. God's seated me there. So if I've still got these desires, my hope is, you know what? I'm no longer subject to that. There's another way out. It's not that I'm not going to be tempted. It, Jesus was tempted by the devil, wasn't he? Turn these stones into bread. Well, it's just a loaf of bread. Come on. But it was, it was about the fact that I'm not going to do what the devil says. You might go, what's wrong with a loaf of bread? Lo bread's not sin. Now, we could get into a theological debate about what that means and we could dig into the Greek and look at it. But the reality is bread wasn't sin, but, but leaning into the, the temptations of the devil. 
It's never going to go, well, that's, that's sin. That's not, that's not how God has designed Jesus to walk. And so Jesus is free because he goes, you know what? I haven't eaten for 40 days. I, haven't, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm, I could turn that son into bread, but I don't need to because there's another way. Whatever the devil presents me, I know there's another way because I'm free. I don't, I'm not stuck into my, into my fleshly desires. I'm not stuck having to live out the desires of my old sin nature. Whatever my sin nature throws at me, I'm just going to push a pause button on that and go, I don't even, even if I can't see a way out yet, I'm just going to push pause because God has always made a way out. God always makes a way out. Oh, but Pastor Rick, you don't understand. How, no, no, I understand. We're all human. But here's the truth and here's the promise. God always makes a way out. God always creates another pathway out of our sin as long as our heart is thrown into, the, <clears throat> into what God has done for us. Ah. Excuse me for one second. This is old school preaching tonight. You know what I'm saying? Like this, I've, never, I've been pastoring for 14, 15 years. This is the first time I've preached on this kind of topic. And I'm like, I've heard heaps of messages, but I've kind of always dug around the outside. I'm going, this is power. This is where I've got to keep coming, bringing myself back to. 2 Corinthians 10 in the New King James Version. This is what I grew up with as well. For though we walk in the flesh, come on, we're still here. We're still on the planet. We're still walking through it. We do not war according to the flesh. So we still war. We're still walking and we're still warring. We've still got battles. We've still got wrestles that we've got to play out. But we do not any longer war according to the flesh. Why? Because the weapons of the way that we fight are not carnal. There's that word. But they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And this is how it works. We cast down arguments. It's not, argue, it's not an argument with your brother. That's, that's, that's an argument that the devil throws in your head. We cast down the arguments that come to us. Oh, you'll never be any better than this. You'll never be able to get off that thing. You'll never be able to break that temptation. You'll never be able to break that habit. You'll never be. We cast down arguments and every other high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we bring every thought that we have and we put it in prison and we bring it captive. And we go, you know what? I've seen you before. I, I, I know where you're coming from. I've seen that thought. You're saying that about me. I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you over here and I'm going to open up the dungeon in the ground. I'm going to kick you in there, stomp you down. I'm going to come back because you don't know Christ. I know Christ and that's not what he says about me. So when I find myself in a personal battle, today, tomorrow, tonight, whenever you're going to run into the next one before you get out of here, just trying to get your mask on the right way. Come on, how's Abby this morning? She walks up to me out in the foyer. She goes, dad, dad, dad. I said, what? She's like, your mask's inside out. <laughs> I said, well, Fantastic. <laughs> We're in a, it's a small battle, but I thought, like, man, this thing's a battle. I'm fighting. But when we have a personal battle, I'm not limited to fighting with worldly strategies. Why? Because I'm no longer at this level. God has raised me up. And see, the, the thing is, if I'm seated in heavenly spaces, if God has put me there, then I've got the ability to fight with heavenly strategies. The space that you're in determines the strategy you fight with. So what are you fighting with? How are you fighting in your battles? That all comes from your mind space. Where, what space are you in? Are you, are, you, are you casting down every imagination or are you entertaining them and having them over for dinner? You're no good. You're never going to get out of this. That habits. Oh, yeah, come and hang out with me for a while. You, like, you make me feel really good. I'm just going to keep you around the place a bit. Get rid, of, get rid of it. He, heavenly strategies. You know, when Jesus come on the scene, he taught, like, for a lot of people, what Jesus taught about how to deal with these battles was revolutionary. But it's interesting because this is something that we would think from the New Testament. But have a look at this from Proverbs 25. Old Testament. If your enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. You will heap burning coals of shame on their heads and the Lord will reward you. That sounds like something from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus would say. But that's from the book of Proverbs. It's always been an option, but when we're in the sin nature, we just can't do it. 
if my enemy is hungry, I'm going to kick him in the teeth and tell him, you know what, serves you right. You shouldn't have been such a mongrel to me. That's, that's a worldly strategy. When your enemy's down, kick him in the teeth. But God says, no, give him food to eat. If they're thirsty, give them water to drink. It's a heavenly strategy, but you can't, you can't engage in a heavenly strategy if your head's not in a heavenly space. Come on, we don't have to live like the world does. We don't have to. You still can. You still can. I, I was scared of the Holy Spirit as a kid because I was like, man, the, I don't want to get possessed by a spirit. It's going to make me do a whole bunch of things that I, I don't want to do. It's going to be like some weird horror movie. Like the, and it might be all good stuff, but what about the times where I don't want to do good stuff? Like I still want to have, and guess what? God doesn't take control of you. If you've got the Holy Spirit, you can still go over here and do something wrong. He doesn't make you fight heavenly strategies, you've still, but you've got the choice. You've got the choice. You can love God and still hate your enemy, but God goes, nah, the love of God's not in you at that point. You can say it, but if your head's not in that space, you're not living it. Come on, you've been raised above your carnality. Uh, that should give someone hope tonight. Someone who's sitting there really quietly going, man, they don't know what I do. I, I really felt that as I prepared this message. There's, there's people in this room tonight and you're saying, you know what, I'm in church and I've got my best clothes on and I'm sitting here and I'm looking brave. But behind your eyes is this battle going on this journey. And you go, if they knew what I was really like, they wouldn't accept me. No, 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 that's not how God works. You're already seated in heavenly places. You are not under your carnality. You are more than the things that you did last night. That's not how God sees you. You are seated with Christ above your carnality. Uh, keep going. You have, been raised, you have been raised above your culture. Uh, you have been raised above your culture. You are seated in heavenly places above your culture. Uh, I love the story of Daniel. Israel's taken into captivity uh, by the Babylonian Empire. And Daniel is one of the young men chosen to serve in the king's palace. Why? Because they wanted to reinculturate him. They wanted to take him out of the godly culture that he'd been in, and they wanted to turn him into a Babylonian servant. But I love Daniel because whether it was his diet that he refused to change, or whether it was his prayer life that he refused to abandon, uh, even when it landed him in a lion's den, he never let the culture around him shift the, gold, the culture that God had placed in him. He never let the culture around, I'm going to say that three times. He never, well, twice, now you think I'm just coming. But the culture around you is going to try and shift you. But Daniel said, you know what? I'm making a distinction between the culture that's around me and the culture that's inside of me. And I'm okay with them being different. I'm going to hold on to that which God has planted in my heart. I am not subject to that which is around me. I'm separated from it. I am lifted above my culture. You know, our culture right now is powering away from Christian values at a rate that we have not seen in the last 100 years. And honestly, it is. Uh, my, my, um, growing up, I had people that were older than me, maybe about how old I am now. <laughs> when I was like a teenager in my 20s, and they would say that. And I'd be like, yeah, it's uh, like I get it, but it's okay. But now, now I've got some more context in life and I've been around for a few more decades. I'm like, Wow. Like literally, our world is going to hell in a handbasket. It's trying to get there quicker and quicker every week. There's something new that I look at and I'm like, really? Are we going there already? Like I thought that'd be like 2030, you know what I mean? But it's 2021 and, and we've taken a leap in one year what I thought might take 10. Our culture is powering away from Christianity as quick as it can. And I'm not trying to get down on the world around us. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying this because we have to understand that kingdom culture and godly principles and anybody who holds to them, by the way. Because kingdom culture and godly principles don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in the hearts of men and women that have decided to dedicate their heart to Christ. And so we are carriers of kingdom culture. You don't have to be. 
But I, I pray that you are. I pray you're a person that says, you know what? I don't want to do things the world's way. I want to do things God's way. I want my life to be determined by what's written on the pages of Scripture, not just what the news tells me that I should do or the influences on Instagram tell me I should do. I, I'm different to that. There's a culture inside of me that's set apart, that is holy, that is, that is set apart for a reason. God wants to do something with me. But if you are a person that carries kingdom culture, then guess what? You are going to be ridiculed. You are going to be mocked wherever you turn. And give it enough time, you're probably legally prosecuted as well. That's where our world is going. And I hate to say it, but sometimes I think the culture around us has more impact on us than perhaps we realize. And like Paul, I want to remind us tonight, let's not forget where our life comes from. Okay, so he's, he's writing to the church in Ephesus saying, I know you're following Jesus, but don't, don't, don't start to slip back and start to, you, you were once dead. Don't go back to where you were dead. Your life comes from Christ. The hope that's in your heart is not coming from the culture that you're in. It's coming from the gospel that I preach to you. Christ has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. I want you to understand that church in Ephesus. That's what he's saying. And I'm kind of saying the same thing tonight. Let's not forget where our life comes from. If you've got some life and God's done something in your life, don't walk away from Him and think that it's going to sustain and, and kind of keep going like that. You need to stay plugged into everything that God's doing for you because He is your life source. He was the one who gave you new life. He was the one that raised you up. John 15 verse 5. Jesus speaking, he says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me. Yeah. Ah, that's more than a daytime decision. Yeah. That's more than just like a nice prayer at an altar call. Yeah. That's more than raising your hands in worship on a Sunday night and then going back out and doing whatever you did last week. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do how much? Not very much. That's in the minuses where I come from. You can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and they wither. Here's the thing. Our life comes from the vine. We are but branches. Never, never start to believe that your, own, your, own, uh, your own mail. Don't read your own mail. Because you got mail about yourself. You write stuff down pretty good. I'm doing this. Don't, don't believe your own mail. Come on, stay plugged into the vine. We are just a branch. I, I got nothing to offer you than, than what flows out of the vine, comes into this branch, and hopefully it's part of the kingdom of God. I love it. Last week I preached about this thing where the kingdom of God is like a tree that grows up and, and nests, and birds come and nest in its branches. I, I pray that we're all just branches on the same tree. That we're all branches coming off the same vine. And if, and if I'm not plugged into the vine, if my life is not coming from the vine, then guess what? I got nothing to offer you. I'm not that good looking. I'm not that intelligent. I got nothing to offer you other than what I get from the vine. And so be mindful of how much credibility you give to the culture around you. Be careful of the TV and the media that you allow yourself to enjoy. Be aware of how the culture around us is constantly communicating to us. The, the stuff that you put on TV, the stuff that you listen to, the, the things that you scroll and you, you click on, they are communicating something to you. Hey, this is how you find love. This is what makes you valuable. This is what you should think about political parties. This is how you should, this is how you should position yourself on social issues. They're communicating something to you. It's coming at you 24-7. Be careful how much credibility you give to the culture around you. Be careful and mindful, young person, because sexuality and gender and relational issue, issues, come on, it's coming at us everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Our culture is driven by what the Bible calls the spirit of this age. Yeah. And it's communicating its values with us more boldly than ever. Like our kids in school are getting taught stuff that you would never have told a high schooler five years ago. Our culture is coming after us. It wants to eradicate Christian belief from the earth. And it's not new for our era. It's been like that throughout history. You want to be a believer? You want to be above your culture? It's going to cost you something. 
It's going to take everything you've got to stand upon Christ and say, this is where I'm living my life. This is how I do this. We have been raised above our culture. We are seated in high places above our culture. So, so let's not fall back into what God has lifted us out of. Don't give it more credit than it deserves. Last one. You ready? For, you got one more? I got five minutes left. You got one, you got one more? What was the first one? I can't remember. You've been raised out of your carnality. Good word. That's why I forgot it. I've forgotten the word. You've been raised out of your carnality. You've been raised above your culture. And just for the sake of alliteration, you've been raised above your crisis. You have been raised above your crisis. Romans 8, I love this verse. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. It says, and we know. Who knows anything? Who's, who's got a brain in their head tonight? Give me a wave if you know stuff. This is what we know as believers. In case you're not sure what you know, if you, if you don't know what you believe, let, let, Paul just reminds us here in this incredible work called Romans. He says, and we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for the good of those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. So if you know with great confidence that God is working it all together, don't allow your crisis to become the crutch that you're leaning on to get you through life. If you need a crisis to lean upon to give you validity and everything that comes out of your mouth, if you're coming, how, how's your week? Oh, you wouldn't believe what happened this week. This happened to me and that happened to me. Oh, it's unbelievable that I'm so busy and this person did. How come we can't have conversations? How was your week? My week was so good. I stood upon the Word of God and God changed me. I, I, I lifted myself above my culture. I lifted myself above my crisis. And you know what? I had some stuff to deal with this week, but God is good and I'm walking through the valley. I'm not staying here. Oh, you should see everything hell's throwing at me. I'm just, it's coming at me from all sides. Come on, you've been lifted above your crisis. You are seated in heavenly places. You don't need a crisis to make you, to make you important. Don't make your, cri your conversations about your crisis. You are not the sum total of the things that have happened to you. You are not the result of everything that you're dealing with right now. Who's dealing with some stuff? Come on, let's be honest. I'm dealing with stuff. I was talking to Nina last night, going to sleep. I said, I'm just, I'm just fighting stuff in my head. It's just stupid thoughts. I'm like, they'll be gone in the morning. I just know I've got to preach tomorrow night and God is fighting me in my head. Sorry, not God. The devil's fighting me in my head. That's what the thoughts do. They wear you out. They just, they make you, yeah, God will go after you too sometimes, you know. <laughs> you idiot, Rick, no. <laughs> but who knows that I'm not the sum total of the stuff that I was thinking last night at half past 11. That's not my life. That's not what I'm subject to. I love it. This is Pastor Ash this morning. I said to leaned over and worship. I said, you, you changed my sermon this afternoon. You preached so good this morning. I just went home and I said, you know what? I'm stealing that and preaching it again. Who am I? I'm not my crisis. Second Peter 1, I am a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? So that we may declare the praises of Him who's called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. You know, Pastor Ash, when you preached this this morning, I was... Uh, I was thinking about the British royal family. I don't know why the British, that's just the royal family that I think of. Olivia was asking me yesterday, there's like some 20 cent and 10 cent coins on our kitchen table. And we're just, we're, we're flip, flipping uh, coins. You know, just, Poppy was teaching her how to flick, flick a coin. And she picks one up, she goes, Dad, why is the queen on the money? <laughs> I said, the queen's the boss. And so you just do whatever the queen says, right? And you'll be okay in life. But you are a royal priesthood. Get this, I reckon this is going to bless you. The royal family is always in a crisis. <laughs> 
Who knows it to be true? Come on, in my lifetime, it started with like Charles and Diana, you know, and Charles's affairs with Camilla Parker Bowles and then Diana tragically dying in the car accident and crisis after crisis. I mean, just in the last two years, Prince Andrew spending all his time with Jeffrey Epstein, the pedophile, and it's like uh, Prince Harry, whose whole life has been a scandal, you know, marrying Meghan Markle, and then there's the Megxit scandal, and then there's the, the death of Prince Philip, and the, the two years before that, the time he rolled his car and crashed it on the grounds of Balmoral, and and then you now, now Prince William and Prince Harry aren't speaking anymore. Like, it's just one crisis after another. But have you noticed after all of this? I mean, that's just in my lifetime. The, the Queen's been in, what, 140 years or something? Like, it's just been one after another after another. Crisis after crisis after crisis. Here's the thing have you noticed after all of their crisis? It's like home and away, it's out of control. But have you noticed after all that they've been through, they're still the royal family? Nothing of their dysfunction has stopping them, is stopping them from walking out under that balcony at Buckingham Palace and looking down at the people whenever the occasion calls for it and waving to the people and everyone just going ballistic on the grounds underneath. Yeah! And they dress up in all their kit and they look amazing. And it's like, there's not a problem in the world because they're the royals, a royal priesthood. And crisis after crisis after crisis, they're still royal because what you go through doesn't change who you are. What you're dealing with behind the scenes doesn't change your identity. It doesn't remove your last name. If you are a son or a daughter of the living God, you don't get unsunned or undaughtered when you make a mistake. It's like, oh, I'm, not, I'm like only half a son. You know, the prodigal son was still a son. He might've been away from his father, but he, when he came back, he was still a son. The father never once entertained the concept that he would be a servant. See, when God, by His grace, raises you up, come on, stand with me, raise yourself up. There you go. Raise yourself up. When He raises you up, He lifts you above your crisis. He raises you out. He gives you a new perspective. He changes everything about the way that you viewed your life. There's new options on the table. If you were looking at the menu of life and you were just eating cabbage every day of your life, all of a sudden God puts new things on the menu. Now there's like burgers and steak and Japanese and soup. And there's a lot of options on the table when you're following Jesus. It was fried cabbage before that every day. But in Christ, there's, there's options. You are just set free. You are set free from anything that would try to define who you are. Why? Because God has lifted you out of your dysfunctional upbringing. God's lifted you out of your childhood abuse. God's lifted you out of your poverty and your lack. He lifted you out of that. He lifted you out of that medical diagnosis that you haven't, ever, you haven't even had yet. You're gonna get it in 20 years time. You've already been lifted out of that. God's lifted you out of that. You've been lifted out of your failed marriage, out of your habitual sin, out of the limitations of your personality that we're all so aware of. God has lifted you out of that and He has seated you with Christ in high places. Why did He do this? Just because He loves us. Because He's full of love, grace and mercy. Oh God, I'm so grateful that you're a God of mercy. I can't speak for anybody else, God, but I know as for me, if it wasn't for your grace, God, I know I wouldn't be standing here. I know me and you know me and you loved me anyway. You gave me your grace anyway. And God, I pray for someone tonight that their faith would start to rise. 
that their gaze would start to lift. Because God, at the end of the day, you've done everything that you need to do to set us free. We just got to now come by faith and receive the gift. We come by faith, God, and we receive the gift. Come on, with every head bowed tonight. Every head bowed. Everyone's eyes closed. Come on, I want you to spend just a moment with God tonight. Don't look at the person next to you. Don't look at the band on the stage. Don't look at me. Don't look at your watch. Don't look at your phone. Come on, just you and God tonight. What is it that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about that you've already been set free from, but tonight you know He's asking you to take a step out of something. By faith, to take a mental step out of something. Come on, is it dysfunction in a relationship tonight? Is it a sin that you've given to God before, but you just keep falling back in? Is it, is it a part of your personality that you're wrestling with that you know it is not how it should be, but, but you've given it to God before, but it just keeps rearing its ugly head. Come on, just give it back to God tonight. Come on, by faith, what's He asking you to step out of or what's He asking you to step over? Come on, what's holding you back? Maybe it, I, Just for my points, is it the carnality of your heart? Is it the culture that you're in? Is it the crisis that you're dealing with? I don't know what it is tonight, but come on, in a moment between you and God, just right now, give it over to Him. Come on, if that's you and while no one is looking around, just raise both hands to God and say, God, I surrender again. I surrender again. I surrender again. I surrender again. God, you know what it is. I don't even have to say it. You know what it is, God. You know what it is. You know what it is. And I need your help with this, Holy Spirit. Oh, God, we need you. We need your help, God. We need your help in this place. By faith, God, we step towards you tonight. We step over that thing. We, we, we push it to one side and we say, that's not who I am. I am a son of God. I am a child of God. I am a daughter in Christ. I, I'm set free from that already. And by faith, I look to you tonight. I look to where my help comes from. Father, you see every hand raised across this building. Every hand represents a story. Every hand represents a struggle, God. Every hand represents a, a reality that I don't know about, but you do. And so God, I pray even from this moment tonight, there would be a supernatural infusion from heaven that would not just set people free in their minds, but God, I'm praying tonight for a supernatural breakdown of strongholds, God. We don't fight in the flesh, but we fight in the Spirit tonight. And I declare with the authority of Christ that there would be things broken off people's lives tonight by the Word of God, by the power of people's testimony. Father, let people be set free in this place tonight. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, if you believe it, why don't you say amen and give God a hand of praise in this place. Come on, give God some praise. He's so worthy. So good.